One ring to rule them all, one ring to find them, one ring to bring them all, and in the darkness find them. I think there are two commonly held opinions of Tolkien and his literature. The first one, oddly enough, is shared by both the far right and the far left ends of the political spectrum. And it's the idea that his writing is replete with white supremacist and sexist dog whistles. We've all seen the lamestream media criticism and orc posting memes suggesting as much. Now, I have to admit, as a huge Tolkien fan and someone who despises the notion of open borders... I probably like orc posting a little more than is good for me. Just, just look at it. It's fucking glorious. So it's a pretty safe bet that the left-leaning anti-Tolkien articles are written in earnest. Or if they are, in fact, insincere clickbait hyperbole with the cynical ulterior motive of page views and ad revenue, their authors and publishers, should they be challenged over the opinions expressed, will go to bat for the idea that Tolkien himself was in fact racist and sexist. They will have little problem making full-throated arguments that Tolkien consciously injected supremacist and misogynistic propaganda into his prose. In other words, they won't hesitate to engage in further personal attacks against him, even if they're only looking for clicks. The York posting, though, without making more out of it than is necessary, hopefully, says very little about what Tolkien the man and author intended to express. Its satirical crosshairs remain steadily hovering over the reality of foolish open borders policy in the real world. I don't imagine your average orc poster cares what personal political leanings, if any, are revealed in the professor's fiction. It's enough for this person that humorous real-world parallels with more than a shred of truth to them can be drawn, whether Tolkien meant to seed his work with such Easter eggs or not. And even if both sides agree that the political applicability of his writing was a conscious effort on Tolkien's part, they will differ on whether those intentions make him a savior of Western civilization or a horrible, racist, and misogynistic monster. And if ultimately there is any meaningful distinction to be found between those two separate identities. So that's the first opinion that Tolkien was a Nazi, intentional or honorary. And the other prominent opinion, in my estimation, is something quite different. Because it's held by a lot of normies out there. And we all know they don't think too much, if they don't have to. They've seen all the movies, but couldn't tell you what the hell the Silmarillion is, or how you should pronounce it. This opinion of theirs is that there isn't anything particularly political whatsoever to be found in his stories. What the hell is wrong with you for even suggesting it? What are you trying to get at, suspicious person? Or at least that's how the opinion will be initially formulated and expressed, because they'll say this, and then a few thoughtful ones will pause and wrinkle their nose a bit at their own statement. Even though they probably haven't seen a single orc posting meme or read a feminist critique of Tolkien, as they stop to consider it a bit more, what they have noticed is that there is indeed an uncanny tendency for his tales to get referenced in leftist counterculture. Who among them has an air guitar to Led Zeppelin singing about Gollum and the Evil One without putting much thought into the cultural context? Come to that, they'll now realize there is an undeniable hippy-dippy 1960s leftover civil rights and free love era psychedelic edge to Tolkien's art, or at least the popular adaptations of it. Fat hobbits running around barefoot, eating, drinking, and smoking, wizards fooling trolls into turning into stone, magic rings of power, mystical elven cities untouched by time, and so on. Which for these normies, until this somewhat uncomfortable cerebral moment you forced upon them, seemed to make for lighthearted, trippy conversation over a few bong hits and not much beyond that. So those are the two prevailing views of Tolkien out there in the big scary real world as I see it anyway. 
Either he's an evil Nazi misogynist or some kind of half-assed tepid tree hugger. And the difference between those two assessments is pretty stark and striking when you stop and think about it. Either he sat down years ago to willfully brainwash numerous generations into fascism and racial and tribal loyalty and obedience, or he just wanted everyone to chill out and picture some pretty cool Middle Earth scenery and what supernatural beings might get up to in that bucolic imaginary world. So which is closer to reality? Or is this simply another case of truth lying somewhere in between two extremes? That's the question I want to explore in this series, and that exploration will all but ignore the people who have a positive view of Tolkien and get something meaningful for them out of his literature. Why? Because I honestly don't care if, after reading The Lord of the Rings, you put on a Nazi uniform and a little Hitler mustache and march around your house goose-stepping in Zeke Heiling until finally signing on to social media to orc post. Or if you roll a blunt and get wasted with your long-haired friends talking about how cool it would be to hike around the Shire with Frodo. If you appreciate it somehow, some way, and it enriches your life in whatever intellectual, artistic, and philosophical manner that works for you, there isn't much for us to discuss or debate. So that leaves the diehard feminist and progressive types who can't stand Tolkien and what it is they believe he stands for. And it also leaves us with an analysis which contrasts their worldview with one that we're told we can glean from passages in the Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings. That, to me, is where the more interesting conflicts and dichotomies lie. If you disagree, or if you still find yourself scratching your head over why anyone would bother with such an esoteric exercise, well, then this series likely won't be for you. If you're still with me and do think there is some worthy intellectual ground to cover here, be sure to engage in all those little like, share, and subscribe activities, and most importantly, drop some knowledge in the comments section. I do appreciate the encouragement and the food for thought. Okay, let's lay some ground rules for this series. I will only be referencing the Silmarillion and the Lord of the Rings. I won't be talking about Leaf by Niggle or Farmer Giles of Ham or the Smith of Wooten Major or any of that other obscure stuff that I'm sure has a ton of literary merit, but unfortunately all of no one has ever read or cares about. I myself have only ever read Leaf by Niggle off of that short list years and years ago and now couldn't to save my life tell you what the hell it was about. When it comes to Tolkien, I'm all about the tales from Middle Earth, and I'll accept whatever criticism comes my way for that short-sighted bias. I'm not saying that favoritism of mine is right, I'm just admitting it exists. I'm not sure if I'll be talking about The Hobbit in this series. It's very possible, but right at the moment, I don't have a good sense of how it pertains. As far as progressivism is concerned and how to define it, I suppose I could waste a lot of time and energy delving into some lengthy historical examination which brings us up to the present day state of affairs, but for simplicity's sake and to avoid, well, avoiding the real point of this series, we will limit the definition to the notion that it means all people are equal and there are no important differences between individuals, genders, and races. Given the same environmental factors and the same opportunities, everyone will achieve the same levels of success, regardless of their genetics or biology. And perhaps most importantly, we are all therefore identical, uninteresting, unexceptional participants in a new borderless order of global equality. If you have problems with that definition and want to add or subtract something, by all means do so in the comments section. But just understand that that is the definition I will be operating with throughout the entirety of this series. And you will have to get in early to change my mind here, meaning directly below in this video's comments section. Do it right now, don't wait. And finally, even though he was a devout Catholic traditionalist and that set of beliefs inform just about everything he did in life, including or perhaps especially his writing, I will be explaining absolutely nothing to do with Catholicism. You are assumed to know everything you need to about this well-known denomination and its oft-debated doctrine in order to understand the points I make in this series. Since this is the introduction, it is incumbent upon me to give you an idea what to expect from the rest of the series. There will be five or six installments, including this one, all of which I will try my damnedest to keep below 30 minutes, but I make no promises. Here are the working titles. Part 1, Introduction and in Real Life Confrontations. Part 2, Hierarchy versus Equality. Part 3, Race and Gender. Part 4, Good versus Evil. Part 5, Conclusion and Closing Thoughts. And finally, Addendum, maybe Part 6, Hidden MGTOW Kernels. I reserve the right to change the number, name, and purpose of any or all of those episodes, but right now I feel pretty confident that that's how they will shake out. To my mind, those are all the principal differences or conflicts between Tolkien and progressivism, with one exception being that last addendum. 
episode. That will have little or nothing to do with the general purpose of the series, and will serve more as an opportunity for me to review Tolkien's fiction through a lens of MGTOW philosophy. Feel free to skip that if it holds no interest for you, or if the very mention of MGTOW immediately turns you into this guy. I have no idea how long it will take me to complete the series, and while those episode titles seem to be pretty distinct, there will be significant overlap and common themes discussed throughout, so expect some repetition and reinforcement of points made. Oh, and a quick and ultimately pointless note about the movies. I'm not a fan, and I will be talking about them as little as possible. This is about the books. When I do bring up the films, it will most likely be only about how they artlessly trample some vital aspect of character development or valuable motifs from the original prose. And saying this always guarantees me downvotes from rabid Peter Jackson fans, so go ahead and die for that dislike button, Righteous Crusaders. My <laughs> golem going after the One Ring. Make me pay for ignoring the perilous plight of courageous Kiwi filmmakers everywhere. Go ahead, I know you'll do it. One thing I will say in defense of the movies since I do often shit on them, is that trying to apply the same weak progressive arguments against them that were first made against the books is still going to be total crap. No, they do not suffer from these asinine criticisms too. You can't just dredge up the old arguments. They have their own unique problems, thank you very much, and you progressives are too dim-witted to understand what those may be. So instead, you resuscitate your standard tired retinue of unimaginative fainting couch nonsense. And it should go without saying that their imagery is invaluable when it comes to memeing. Okay, so that's the brief overview of the series as a whole. The other purpose of this first introductory episode is to cover the real-world disputes between Tolkien and progressives. I do this in order to avoid this series seeming like a conflict I have dreamt up in my mind. These confrontations were in fact very real, have been legion, and began at pretty much the exact moment The Lord of the Rings was first published. For the most part, this series will not tackle specific instances of these more plebeian and salacious racism and sexism accusations, though I may have to cover them to some extent in Part 3, Race and Gender. But even that installment will be looking to discuss them in a more abstracted and hopefully more constructive manner, or in internet parlance at a more meta level. All the specific attacks and crude back and forths over the superiority or inferiority of individual races or genders, and squabbles like whether or not the Haradrim fighting for Sauron indicate Tolkien and his fans hate Muslims, or if Eowyn proves or denies the existence of sexism in The Lord of the Rings, and all that crap have been hashed out too many times to count. The discussion I hope to focus on in that race and gender episode is whether or not we can find evidence of Tolkien taking a side in the debate over genetics versus environment, or nature versus nurture, which is an essential facet of the progressive worldview. I do want to run my glowing elven blade through one particularly grating criticism here in this introduction, however because I believe it's one of those rare instances where Tolkien was personally affected enough to start altering the legends of Middle-earth, and not in a positive way, if you ask me. But before I get into that, it's worth pointing out something very important about Tolkien's intentions in creating this imaginary world of his, for those who may not be aware. You probably think his aim was simply to write high epic fantasy fiction or a really cool entertaining tale. And while that was no doubt his ambition in part, his real goal was something much more consequential and, well, epic and fantastic. He was, in fact, trying to create the first mythology ever written in English. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, what the hell did he just say? I can pick up a copy of the King James Bible in English off of Amazon, and I'm pretty sure that was authored centuries ago. Well, yes, you can, but remember, the Bible was originally written in Hebrew and Aramaic, and then translated into Greek and Latin. And for hundreds of years, it was a capital crime to translate it from those formal languages accepted by the religious authorities into the vernacular. And in fact, William Tyndall was hanged, and his corpse was burned at the stake for creating one of the first English versions of the Bible. And I think it's obvious that Nordic and Greek and Roman mythologies, among countless others, were all originally written in the native languages of their respective people. So it's no trivial matter to want to write an original mythology for the English language. Now, Tolkien was a philologist by academic training, and this, of course, inspired and informed this effort of his. So that is why there are so many highly fleshed out dialects like Westron and Quenya and Sindarin and the Black Speech, and so on, to be found within his books. How a language develops for him is essential to understanding how a people and their culture develop. They are inextricable. 
Okay, so the criticism that hit home pretty hard for Tolkien was that he consciously and tenaciously diminished female roles or femininity in general. As a religious conservative, he was stereotypically pro-male and anti-female, don't you know? As you can imagine, if you truly understand what it means to be a devout Catholic and to worship the feminine through idolization of the Virgin Mother, an indictment like this can have a pretty powerful effect, despite the rather uncharitable progressive view of Catholicism being something that tries to do the exact opposite. And these feminist critics who levied the accusation knew how to hit him where it hurt most. They knew exactly what they were doing and how unfair it was. But for bitter harpies like them, the only thing that really matters is how much attention they draw to themselves after doing so. So what did Tolkien do to counteract this? He began altering the background tales in the Silmarillion to inflate Galadriel's power and role into something on par with that of Feanor. And it became this pretty ridiculous and pathetic exercise in futility, because Feanor is without a doubt the most influential and powerful elf in all the tales of Middle-earth. He defies the Valar, or the angel gods of Tolkien's world, and does the same to the most powerful member of their order, and therefore the most powerful being in all of Arda, Melkor. And so we learn here that, rather understandably, Feanor's independence is not completely impervious to lies and deceit. Melkor is, of course, the mightiest among the lords of the West, so his powers of persuasion are going to be, well, persuasive. However, Melkor quickly learns, like his more noble-minded brethren, that his supernatural existence and abilities don't mean quite as much to Feanor as he might prefer. It is told that for a time Melkor was not seen again in Valinor, nor was any rumor heard of him, until suddenly he came to Forminos and spoke with Feanor before his doors. Friendship, he feigned, with cunning argument, urging him to his former thought of flight from the trammels of the Valar. And he said, Behold the truth of all that I have spoken, and how thou art banished unjustly. But if the heart of Feanor is yet free and bold, as were his words in Tyrion, then I will aid him, and bring him far from this narrow land. For am I not Valar also? Yea, and more than those who sit in pride in Valimar, and I have ever been a friend to the Noldor, most skilled and most valiant of the people of Arda. Now Feanor's heart was still bitter at his humiliation before Mandos, and he looked at Melkor in silence, pondering if indeed he might yet trust him so far as to aid him in his flight. And Melkor, seeing that Feanor wavered, and knowing that the Silmarils held his heart in thrall, said at the last, here is a strong place and well guarded. But think not that the Silmarils will lie safe in any treasury within the realm of the Valar. But his cunning overreached his aim, his words touched too deep, and awoke a fire more fierce than he designed. And Feanor looked upon Melkor with eyes that burned through his fair semblance, and pierced the cloaks of his mind, perceiving there his fierce lust for the Silmarils. Then hate overcame Feanor's fear, and he cursed Melkor and bade him be gone, saying, Get thee gone from my gate, thou jail crow of Mandos. And he shut the doors of his house in the face of the mightiest of all the dwellers in Ea. I will get more into Feanor's story in part two, Hierarchy versus Equality. For now, just realize that the Silmarillion is, unsurprisingly, named after Feanor's greatest creations, the unbreakable jewels called the Silmarils. And the oath to retake them from diabolical Melkor sealed the fate and the downfall of the elves who followed him into exile out of the hallowed, undying realm of Valinor. So in order for Galadriel to be on par with Feanor, she'd have to do something pretty impressive, right? Something that affected all of history. The problem, however, is that if she does anything truly meaningful, it will alter already established elven lore or canon. So what does Tolkien have her do? Just a bunch of inept, petty stuff to piss off Feanor. Ironically enough, not unlike what the feminists were doing to him in the real world. She unfriended him, I guess on Elf Book or whatever, and denied him some strands of her hair. Not once, not twice, but three times. Remembering Gimli here and their interaction in Lorien, 
It does seem like everyone wanted some of her hair. She must have had some really nice locks, you know. Now, you could say that Tolkien purposely made Galadriel's, quote, great, unquote, deeds so sad and pathetic in order to mock feminists criticizing him. But I seriously doubt it. I think he respected his own work enough to avoid such cynical and spiteful manipulation. Unfortunately, I think the truth is he really believed it would appease his critics if he did something like this, or at least that it would show the rest of the world how much he revered women. And maybe he was naive enough to assume you could in fact placate such insatiable harpies, and that they wouldn't simply move the goalposts on him to some other way he was being sexist or racist in his stories. What Tolkien, like a lot of people targeted by feminists and social justice warriors, didn't understand is they are never satisfied, and their moaning should never be taken seriously. After all, what is wrong with writing a story populated by mostly male characters, or where all or most strong and influential characters are male? What is wrong with appealing to a male audience and writing stories men would actually care to read? Feminists don't like such literature. They can be the big, strong, independent women they keep claiming they are and go write their own stories. Fact of the matter is, had Tolkien changed every last character in The Silmarillion and The Lord of the Rings to female ones and titled these books The Galadriel Rillion and The Lady of the Rings or some crap like that, they would have simply complained that as a male author, he had no right to speak so thoroughly on the behalf of women and their lived experience or that he was drowning out the voices of female authors, or that he was guilty of gender appropriation, or nine million other ridiculous reasons. These are talentless people racked with envy who don't even really care about the arguments they're making. They just want everyone to stop producing works they themselves are incapable of creating. They want us all to curl up into ineffectual, do-nothing, miserable balls like they've become. They want us all to be their equals. But I am, of course, getting ahead of myself. Unfortunately, Tolkien didn't have enough experience with them to understand this, and he foolishly embarked down the road to nowhere in an attempt to make them happy instead of letting the greatness of his writing, which flies in the face of progressivism, speak for itself. The road goes ever on and on indeed. All right, so hopefully this introduction sets the stage and gets us all in the right mind frame for the rest of this series. Babbled enough for one introduction, I think. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for the other installments in this series. I'm pretty excited about making them, so I hope you guys are looking forward to watching them. For those of you who have been with me since the beginning of this channel, it'll be like a return to the glory days before I got hit by a ton of bogus DMCA strikes. Alright everybody, see you in the next upload.